So we did talk about the air compressors and the dryers and the pressure reducing valves. And then we talked about, in general, where pneumatics are in the marketplace. They certainly aren't going away. As everybody talks about the demise of uh, pneumatics, they're still, still going to be out there for a long period of time. So with that, uh, are there any uh, questions uh, on the line? Dave, do you want to try and uh, look at the? At yeah. The Thanks, guys. Uh, actually, we did receive some uh, chat questions during the presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and read those. Um, and while we go ahead and do that, uh, I just want to let everybody, give everybody else a chance to put some more questions in if you want to do that. And like, again, if you, if you have a phone connection, um, you can raise your hand and we can call on you as well. Um, first question is from Jose. He asks, how often should the compressor oil be replaced and, and how often should the air filters be replaced? Well, as opposed to an automobile where we're actually using the oil in the cylinder, that oil will become foul very quickly, and that's why we change our oil every 3,7500 miles. In this case, we're taking fresh air, and there is some particulate that will make it past the filters, which will eventually foul the oil. It's primarily important to make sure that the level is up to where it belongs. And I would suggest changing that probably every six months to be safe. Of course, that's the lifeblood of the system. If lubricity breaks down or if there's particulate, that'll become abrasive to your journals on the crank. It'll damage the bearings, and it'll score the piston, the, uh, the bore, and uh, shorten the life of the rings. So we don't want those abrasives in there. Best to uh, drain it. And then the filters, in terms of filters, that's a very good question because some compressors actually will take, uh, as opposed to a small sponge type, they'll have a very large element. The larger the element, the uh, longer the life, typically. I would look more at visual buildup on the external foam filter. And uh, maybe, Carl, you've got something to add to that. I, I was just thinking, uh, as you, you were saying, John, I agree 100%. Also, one of the things to look at would be just uh, look in, and try and document your particular building uh, to look at uh, installations and operating manuals uh, to be able to now easily kind of go online now with the Internet sure. the, the last number of years to be able to download if you don't have manuals there, but to, certainly to document your particular brand of compressor, your particular model number, and then look at the manufacturer's recommendations uh, for, for the amount of time that you should wait between changing oil and, like John was saying, look at the, at the air filters. Okay. Uh, uh, Gary is raising his hand, and I'm going to give him audio control. Uh, Gary, can you, are you on the line? Hi, hey, Gary. Morning, Gary. Uh, we're having some trouble hearing. Uh, we're going to move on to the next. Uh, we have a text question from Mark. How are the pressures changed between day and night, manually or automatically? Day and night, it's typically done with a time clock, or it can be done at the command of a building automation system. And maybe your question is more on how it's done. That can be done as depicted on the slide with an electro-pneumatic valve. There are other systems that will literally have two regulators, one day regulator, one night regulator, and then there's a large three-way valve that simply selects the output of the appropriate regulator based on the time clock or DDC system. So hopefully that answers your question. So the pressure will always be what we want it to be based on the uh, command from the clock or the DDC system. Yeah, I'd just uh, like to add, similar to what we're talking about, that could be also manually changed. So we see that in a lot of school systems where the you know, the, the custodian is in at, uh, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning, and he throws a manual pneumatic uh, switch from left to right, and it's just a rotation from uh, night back to day. So if he's doing that at 5.30 in the morning, he's there as a custodian, and then all of the thermostats then go to the day mode in the school. And then perhaps the next uh, shift of custodians then leaves at 7 or 8 o'clock at night, and then they switch that same manual switch from the, night mode, uh, day mode back to the night mode, and then all of thermostats go to the set point for the night mode, hopefully saving energy. And especially in systems that have summer winter operation, that's typically a manual operation. Because we have to index the entire system from heating to cooling, and quite often that will entail starting a chiller, those kinds of things that have to be done manually. So hopefully that answered the question. Okay, uh, Edward has his hand raised. Ed Edward, um, I want to give it a try and see if we can hear you. Yes, how are you doing? It's Eddie from Industrial Cooling Club. Good morning, Eddie. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for calling. Uh, 
Tom. Thanks for the uh, webinar. Uh, we're sort of interested in, you know, retrofitting uh, to DDC the pneumatic stack. I mean, like you said, the uh, cost prohibitive to change all of the zones. And I hear you guys have a uh, some kind of system out there that you can actually do wireless and retrofit the actual stack pneumatics in the background and just change the air handles over to DDC. That is correct. There is a, a product now. It's it's really a thermostat inside of a box that has a receiver, a radio receiver, and a small servo, and it adjusts the set point of the thermostat at the command from a head-end system. And uh, that's relatively recent technology, the benefits of which are that if the electronics fail or batteries fail, that kind of thing, we really revert back to a simple pneumatics uh, thermostat. It's just that we've added an element of control to adjust the set point of that stat remotely and, and do some other neat tricks. So uh, that is available now, yes. Are there any uh, sites in the area that can... Uh, Which area are you down near, Eddie? Uh, we're in uh, Metuchen, New Jersey. Oh, and oh, I, I would have to check. We can look into that if you wish. Uh, we'd like to look at it, because you've got a couple of jobs like that. We're thinking of, uh, oh, you know, we'll do DDC on the air handles, like you said, but we got to keep the, we can't do the zones. Right. And actually, the, the best thing to do is to call John Dempsey. He's uh, uh, listed in the next slide. I think it's probably the slide after this. And he could help you through with that. Okay. Any well, other? And, yeah, we have uh, some other questions. So we'll, um, we have a question from Atul on the text. Uh, what is the typical cost difference between pneumatic and DDC systems? Are we talking a retrofit, replacing like for like, or are we talking about putting a DDC front end on an existing pneumatic system? It's somewhat subject to the installation. Well, do, do you want to give a total chance to, to follow up with, with a follow-up question, or do you want to and, and move on, or do you want to try to address it now? Well, I'll address it now see if we can get some clarification. Okay. Oh, well, let's, uh, okay, so we'll... We'll take the next question then, and then maybe we'll come back to this. Sure. Um, okay, uh, Guadalupe, uh, how do I get a, a copy of the slideshow? And actually what we're going to do is we're going to send out an email uh, to everyone who registered and attended, uh, which is going to link to uh, a video of the slideshow. So you'll have audio and visual of this, and you'll, you'll get a copy of all the questions. Uh, we have another uh, text question from Hank. Um, is there, a, is there any reference material um, that he can download? And uh, uh, Guys, do, you have, do we have anything else besides the actual slideshow that we, we want to give people? Not to the best of my knowledge. Fortunately, with the web, all the manufacturers of pneumatics have really good detailed service information, but they also have calibration information as, uh, as, as well. It'll point to special tools that you need, uh, techniques, and means of doing it properly. And I would never endeavor to do calibration or service on this without at least some basic manufacturer's information. There's ports that are uh, on most devices that are not marked, and those ports are very critical to pressure and uh, pressure measurement and calibration. So there's a lot of stuff on the web. Uh, we can get to uh, most of that material through the ICD website. So uh, if there's a lot of demand for this, perhaps we could start a, a, a section just for tech support, but at this point we don't have it. We uh, just invite people to visit the site and, and drill through and get the manufacturer's sheets. Yeah, David, maybe you want to, uh, I, I, right, we're, we're trying to advance the slide to the contact information, but perhaps uh, because there's a lot of questions around that, if we could advance the slide one, uh, we could show up the industrial contacts of uh, the folks that want to be able to call their industrial controls rep. Here we go. 